on strategy in general. Um, boldness. This is a chapter on boldness. Um, it's, it's interesting. <laughs> well, they all are. Because I've been looking at a few other sort of talks on military strategy and things like that, and they're mostly full of crap. You know, it's all talk about things that don't really have any relation to anything you can fully understand. It's very convoluted and sort of, you know, without any sort of parallel to any real world that I would understand. Whereas, you know, things like that, chapter headed boldness. And it's like, it's, it's understandable, isn't it? I mean, you know, I mean, I think you can talk about boldness. Definitely, and um, it'd be interesting to see what it says. I read the first sort of paragraph. Um, I mean, some some of his stuff's a bit wishy washy, but just checking the microphone. Hopefully, it works. Yeah, it seems to be sort of twiddling. I can't really tell whether it works or not. That's one of the problems. Um, and there's a video capture as well. So let's get a, let's get something open that we can look. At. Let's look at this one for boldness. I um, just want to keep the screen moving, really. So I'll read, I'll read it out. Um, I think I'm going to read one paragraph and then talk about it so that I can reflect. I suppose just read the whole thing out. In the chapter dealing with the certainty of success, we discussed the place that boldness occupies in the dynamic system of forces and the part it plays when opposed to prudence and discretion. We tried to show that the theorist has no right to restrict boldness on doctrinal grounds. You know, already there, we've got this fantastic sort of like diatribe of terms. You know, I mean, the certainty of success as a, as a concept. Um, you know, the, the, talking about the place that boldness occupies in the dynamic system of forces and the, pl the part it plays in, part it plays when opposed to prudence and discretion. So, you know, prudence, discretion. I mean, these are not things that you would sort of readily associate with 21st second military doctrine strategy or methods of engaging war um, yeah I just think it's interesting that there's we can we can you know it's just such a clear sort of variance to what you might expect uh, we tried to show that the theorist has no right to restrict the boldness to, the, the theorist has no right to restrict boldness on doctrinal grounds. I don't really know what that means. I think what he's saying is a theorist would sort of restrict boldness on the terms of on, on a, in the concept of doctrinal methods. I think doctrinal methods are where you you do things methodically by a certain process, which is actually what's tied up into doctrine. For example, Second World War doctrine would have two units in front and a similar unit behind, so two two regiments on the front line, one behind in reserve, and that was a sort of a doctrinal method. Um, and, you know, the ways that they would exchange troops would be all, you know, highlighted. They would have, for, for every sort of uh, regiment, they would have, a, you know, two company-level artillery um, units and a regimental-level artillery unit, um, field... Regimental or field artillery, I can't remember what they call field regimental artillery, FAMS, field artillery. Hmm. Anyway, the next paragraph. But this noble capacity to rise above the most menacing dangers should also be considered as a principle in itself, separate and active. Indeed, in what field of human activity is boldness more at home than in war? So, but this so it's, it's, I don't know what it says, um, but this noble capacity to rise above the most menacing dangers. So I, th I think what we're talking about there is boldness as a noble capacity to rise above the most menacing of dangers um, should be considered as a principle in itself, separate and active. So I, I, I think what we're saying there is boldness is the ability to rise above menacing dangers. I wouldn't necessarily say that is the case. I think boldness, without going any further in my own understanding, is, um, I don't know, I think the ability to take an initiative, um, 
unprompted with with a lot of certainty. For example, you could be bold and take something out without there being a great deal of danger, but because it was unexpected. Um, perhaps the battle hasn't started yet in Napoleonic terms, and you boldly take out an artillery position and think, well, we shouldn't have got there because we haven't done our initial promenading and artillery barrages and, you know, I don't know, maybe that's not a good example, but I'm not sure I agree with um, the fact that not boldness is, is just the ability to rise up above menacing dangers, but it certainly probably plays into that. I would have thought that that would be bravery. Um, but anyway, um, I mean, for example, in here, it would be brave to cross this river, um, but it would be a bold move to move all of these units instantly over here. Or it would be a bold move to move them instantly here, into, into there. Whereas the whole process is an act of bravery, an individual act that would be not necessarily, would, that would achieve a greater significant aim in front of the end, not so much in front of the enemy, but in, in the face of sort of like what was expected to have been done. That's, that's a variant on what's expected to be done. Um, I mean, this one might actually be a better example on boldness. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say it was boldness, but they basically attack the headquarters of the um, MNJTF, the Multinational Joint Task Force, uh, the Boko Haram units. So you could say that's a bold move uh, because uh, it's audacious and it's attacking the very centre of the organisation that's opposing you. But it's not a really big one because there's not a lot of units in there. Um, you know, so it would be bold to sort of think of something like that to attack you know, the very centre of control um, and not necessarily brave and, and not necessarily facing a menacing danger. Although you are engaged in a menacing danger in that you attack this and you will have the whole of the army against you. So, you know, that could be that the overriding, the greater menacing danger to sort of, to know that once you've done that, they are really going to come down on you. Maybe not there, but later. So maybe that's what he means by that. Next paragraph. A soldier, whether drummer boy or general, can possess no nobler quality. It is the very metal that gives uh, edge and lustre to the sword. So um, he's saying that a soldier, whether a drummer boy or a general, can possess no nobler quality than boldness. And that boldness is the very metal that gives uh, edge and lustre to the sword. Um, well, maybe... Maybe, maybe boldness is basically a statement of your ability and preparedness to act decisively and swiftly and to do the sorts of things that, you know, once you've seen done, you say, I could do that as well, but you wouldn't necessarily have the ability to have thought of it in advance and to have carried it out in advance before anyone else had really sort of determined that it was something that you were going to do. It's easier to talk in hindsight. Um, anyway. Let us admit, next paragraph, let us admit that boldness in war even has its own prerogatives. It must be granted a certain power over and above successful calculations involving space, time and magnitude of forces. For whatever it is superior, it will take advantage of its opponent's weakness. Um, in other words, it is a genuinely creative force. This fact is not difficult to, uh, to prove even scientifically. Whenever boldness encounters timidity, it is likely to be the winner. Bold, uh, because timidity is in itself implies a loss of equilibrium. Uh, boldness will be at a disadvantage only in an encounter with deliberate caution, which may be considered bold in its own right, um, it, and is certainly just as powerful and effective, but such cases are rare. Timidity is the root of prudence and in the majority of men. Um, just a slight aside, there used to be a television program uh, called Some Others Do Have Them, I think, starring Michael Crawford, and in there they had a saying regarding pilots. There are old pilots and bold pilots, but never old, bold pilots, uh, which would cause endless humility, not humility, endless 
frivolity. It, it made us laugh a lot when we were younger. Um, so it's saying here that um, let's let's admit the boldness in war um, even has its own prerogatives. I don't know, we really know what that means. So, um, it must be granted in it must be granted a certain power over and above successful calculations involving space, time, and magnitudes of force. For whether it for wherever it is superior, it will take advantage of its opponent's weakness. So I'm saying I think I think it's saying that you know boldness is not something that you can you can sort of, you can calculate um, in regards to sort of space, time, and you know, determine and, and the size of forces it has its own sort of dimension in that you can't say, okay, well, we're over here on the left flank, we're going to be bold, we're going to move forward in a bold manner. I mean, it's something that will happen, um, sort of, you know, when it happens. But if a, if a leader or well, basically, yeah, has the ability and a a record of being bold, and it's more likely that they will demonstrate that at some point. Uh, but you can't say, "Well, we're put." <laughs> you're going to be prudent over here um, and not attack anyone, and you're going to be bold and do something that none of us can predict. Okay. Um, okay. Um, this fact is not difficult to prove, even scientifically. Well, I would say it was, uh, but I don't know. I mean. You know, this is over 200 years ago, and the definition of science was probably slightly varied. Um, whenever boldness encounters timidity, um, it is likely to be the winner, uh, because timidity in itself implies a loss of equilibrium. I don't know where he gets that sort of idea from, but um, I mean, I, I guess that makes sense. I don't even have to extrapolate that. It's so obvious, but is it? I don't know. Um, boldness will be at a disadvantage only in an encounter with deliberate caution. So that's where people are being deliberately cautious about anything that you might do. Um, and whenever you engage in your boldness, your bold act, an impetuous charge, they will be instantly on guard um, and will, 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 will exercise their, um, their caution and evade and prepare accordingly, I, I guess. Um, Uh, timidity is the root of prudence in the majority of men. Okay, next paragraph. In most soldiers, the development of boldness can never be detrimental to other qualities because the rank and file is bound by duty and the conditions of the service to a higher authority and thus is led by external intelligence. With them, boldness acts like a coiled spring, suddenly at any time to be released. So... I don't know what it means, I don't know what that sort of really means, um, but basically it's implying that boldness can never be detrimental to other qualities. Um, so other qualities, for example, oh I don't know, looking through, morale, high morale, uh, boldness will never affect high morale, for example, maybe. Um, Anyway, so um, the higher up the chain of command, the greater is the need for boldness to be supported by a reflective mind, so that boldness does not degenerate into purposeless bursts of blind passion. Um, command becomes progressively less a matter of personal sacrifice and increasingly concerned for the safety of others and for the common purpose. Um, I mean, you could say that... Um, just maybe try and change the screen every now and then. Going to Inchon was was a bold act. I'm really getting into the Korean War at the moment, and um, you could say that this was a bold act. It wasn't necessarily against a. I mean, it's, it's, it's committing a large force. It wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't a purposeless, purposeless burst of blind passion, uh, which is sort of demonstrated in, in quite a lot of these. Korean War examples. They, they call it the Forgotten War, and I'm beginning to think maybe they've forgotten it because of all the catastrophes that happened. Not, not necessarily because no one cared. You know, the people, the powers of be, have deliberately sort of forgotten to talk about it because there were so many embarrassing situations where American leaders 
it's basically screwed up and, and as well as the North Koreans, you know, I mean, you know, the, many of their regiments started off with 1,500 men. Now, if they were, at the end, they were still fighting with just 200 left or less, and completely decimated, um, because, they, you know, they were just, they just threw them against the Americans and the Allies, and the, you know, the United Nations forces, and the South Koreans, in the idea that they would win. You know, they just thought they had superior numbers, but you know all, all that is sort of by the by. I mean, you, you know, we got both extremes, but MacArthur's sort of plan at Incheon was a bold move, you could say. And they couldn't say to MacArthur, "Okay, you, you're going to be bold on the um, the Western Front somewhere, something bold involving ships, you know, high tidal range, perhaps, and somewhere north." You know, giving him all the clues, but not really telling him what to do. And then, oh, I know, I'll, I'll do this. You, you know, I mean, you have to think outside of the box, which is, I think, boldness is something that I'm quite keen on in that, in that sense. Being able to sort of rack your brains, because it is difficult to think of not just the first thing that you thought of, but other alternatives, and then to run them through and to do all that quickly. You know, to have a very clear mind of what is possible. Because it's very easy to say, oh, Inchon, yeah, okay, but who else, given us that sort of map, would do it? I and mean, where else could we apply principles of things like Inchon yeah, to other scenarios? Um, you know, I mean, it was unique in, in that sense, in its own right. Um, I mean, you couldn't apply a sort of, you know, that sort of strategic maneuver in Iraq, um, in, you know, as, as the US sort of nation because there is the geography is just not conducive but you know I mean and and they did that left punch which I suppose was sort of something that wasn't expected um, but yeah I mean it, it's sort of you, know, you can start sort of, sort of trying to apply all that stuff and um, it's quite interesting so anyway um, where did we get to? Command becomes progressively less a matter of personal sacrifice and increasingly concerned for the safety of others and for the common purpose. The quality that in most soldiers uh, is disciplined by service regulations that have become second nature to them must in the commanding officer be disciplined by reflection. In a commander, um, a bold act may prove to be a blunder. Nevertheless, it is a laudable error not to be regarded on the same footing as others. Um, happy the army where um, ill-timed boldness occurs frequently. It is a luxuriant weed um, but indicates the richness of the soil. Even foolhardiness, that is, a boldness without any object, is not to be despised. Uh, basically it stems from daring, which in this case has, em has erupted with passion, unrestrained by thought. Um, so that's something that doesn't have thought. So um, counter counterattacks could be, you know, the realm of of boldness because you never know when you want to counterattack because you, you know, by the very nature of it, um, you don't really know when you're going to be attacked and you're going to be required to counterattack. Um, but anyway, only when boldness rebel rebels against obedience, uh, when it defiantly ignores an expressed command, must it be treated as a dangerous offence. Then it must be prevented, not for its innate qualities, but because an order has to, has an order has been disobeyed, and in war obedience is of cardinal importance. Given the same amount of intelligence, timidity will do a thousand times more damage in war than audacity. Um, the truth of this observation will be self-evident to our readers and our listeners. Um, I mean, I guess so. You know, I, I think again and again, I, I find myself trying to sort of contrast modern warfare, which really it doesn't fall into this sort of paradigm because we're not in that situation. I mean, I think the Korean War was probably the last time that the Americans and the Allies and or well, anyone really had a had a full on proper war. And although the Iran Iraq War was quite large in scale. I just think they were in a world of their own with, with regards to sort of military strategy and these sorts of principles. It was more sort of, you know, religious dogmatism and, and things like that. But, um, 
you, you know, you had that scope where you had ranks and files of people, you know, in trenches, along hills, and, you know, engaging in massive assaults across rivers and taking positions out and marches and retreats and things like that. Um, but, you know, when you sort of think about what's happening in, um, in the Middle East, you know, there's no such thing as taking a bold act in sending in 20 or 60 or 100 uh, ballistic missiles. It's not a bold act. There's nothing, there's no room or scope for bold actions um, other than on the front line. And, you know, it's that distance from the front line that sort of takes away a lot of that sort of scope of, you know, military action. And, and you know, I don't want to go on too much on, on that, but it's, it is fairly central, I think. Given the same amount, uh, given the same, uh, yeah, yeah, I read that. In fact, the supervention um, of a rational purpose ought to make it easier to be bold and therefore less meritorious. Yet the opposite is true. The power of the various emotions is sharply reduced by the intervention of lucid thought and more by self-control. Consequently, boldness grows less common in the higher ranks. Um, even in the growth of an officer's perception and intelligence does not keep pace uh, with this rise in rank. The realities of war will impose their conditions and concerns on him. I don't think I read that in its proper context. Consequently, boldness grows less common in the higher ranks. Full stop. Even if the growth of an officer's perception and intelligence does not keep pace with his rise in rank, the realities of war will impose their conditions and concerns on him. Uh, indeed, their influence on him will be greater the less he really understands them. In war, this is the main basis for the experience expressed in the French proverb Tilbury or Sicon qui s'eclipse au premier. <laughs> That's my French accent for you. Let me read it again. Tilbury or Sicon qui s'eclipse au premier. Nearly every general known to us from history as mediocre, even valisating, was noted for a dash and determination was noted for dash and determination as a junior officer. So nearly every general known to us from history as mediocre, even vacillate, 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 vacillating, vacillating, um, was, these are, these are words from 200 years ago, um, was noted for dash and determination as a junior officer. So. I would agree with that to some extent. I wouldn't necessarily say they were, because some of them just they just go through the motions and they get chosen for other reasons. But what it's saying there is that all these mediocre officers would have been less mediocre when they were chosen. Um, and it's justifying that their reason for, for becoming mediocre as part of that sort of process, um, which reduces the amount of boldness that they, they, they can have. I mean, you know, this the, the Korean War is full of full of stories of officers who left West Point in, um, you know, before the, second, before the First World War, and like, were 60 years old and never had a military command, and, 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 you know, were too fat to even get out of their tents and things like that. Um, you know, pretend they had heart attacks so they could go home. Um, a distinction should be made among acts of boldness that result from sheer necessity. Necessity comes in very deg varying degrees. If it is pressing, a man in pursuit um, of his aim may be driven to incur one set of risks in order to avoid others just as serious. In that event, one can admire only his powers of resolution, which, however, are also of, the, are also of value. The young man who leaps across a deep chasm to show off his horsemanship displays boldness. If he takes the same leap to escape a band of savage janissaries, all he shows is resolution. I mean, it's quite an interesting anecdote, really, there, because boldness is something you don't necessarily have to do, um, but you would do for a particular reason, etc., etc. The greater the distance between necessity and action, the more numerous the possibilities um, that have to be identified and analysed before action is taken, the less is the factor of boldness reduced. The less is the factor of boldness reduced. Um, when Frederick the Great 
uh, perceived in 1756 that war was unavoidable and that he and that he was lo lost unless he could forestall his enemies it became a necessity for him to initiate hostilities but at the same time it was an act of boldness because a few men in his position would have dared to act in this way and that, that was what I was going to a bit before it's where you, you're doing something that other people might not dare to sort of to, to, to actually do or to contemplate um, which you, you know makes something bold it's not necessarily something that has to happen um, you've got to be careful about what, how you say things like this but you know I mean you could say that these all these militants like the Taliban are bold um, you, you know they're, they're not acting out of necessity but they're driven by what they do but you could say that their attacks on these are, are bold actions you know they're not being forced to do it and they're putting themselves at risk so whether the enemy or whatever you know they're, they're quite bold and similarly you could almost say well if Pakistan armed forces were to do something they're not just an order from higher above but to, to actually sort of you know carry out bold actions against the Taliban and they could equally well be as, as successful but uh, it's quite hard to identify acts of boldness but after reading this obviously have, have an eye out for it. Um, while strategy is exclusively the province of generals and other senior officers, boldness in the rest of the army is as important a factor in planning as any other military virtue. Um, just, just as a, a secondary aside, I mean obviously there's been a couple of things here. Uh, for example, we've had these Israeli rocket strikes and you could say that was an act, a bold act because they forced the, um, the Syrian and the Iranian's hand to sit there and either respond or to suck it up, and they're sucking it up. You could also say that uh, th both of those actions, that action, the, this, the Israeli rocket strikes and Trump strike, you could say, I can expand this more for a bit, you could, you, neither of these really get to me because there's, there's, I haven't really got a full set of rules in that really sort of complements how you do missile strikes. You know, there's no ground movement. But the point is, you could say, was bold, was Trump's move bold? I mean, he didn't have to do it. He was faced with a certain thing. Um, I, I, well, I don't really want to say it was, but I, I, I'm sort of thinking, hmm, right, it's certainly worthy of asking whether it was. Uh, was it a bold move? Because he certainly didn't have to do it, and that's what we're talking about here. Um, you know, if he hadn't have done it, he would have. You know, a lot of people didn't want him to do it because the, the, you know, the evidence was strong enough. Um, but you, you know, as a demonstration of his ability to do it, whether or not the evidence is there or not, you know, it was a bold move. I would say possibly. I don't want to say it is because I don't want to be quoted on that. But on the subject of boldness, I would, I would suspect that it was a bold move. Because you didn't have to do it. There's a lot of flack, um, but you could say it was other things like stupid, um, possibly. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily say it was, um, but you know, you might want to sort of possibly say, well, I, you know, you, you could look at these things and reflect on them in lots of ways. So, while strategy, yeah, so more can be achieved with an army drawn um, from people known for their boldness, an army in which a daring spirit has always been nurtured than an army that lacks this quality and these are things that really you know really work for me in, in a lot of senses because everything I, everything I do here and you, know, you can apply it to your own life and you know in this modern world they just don't want to you know this whole thing about boldness they don't want people really talking about it as though, oh well it's this person you know is it a virtue you know, everyone is equal and everyone's got the same qualities as everyone else. Everyone can achieve and do as well as anyone else. But it's saying here quite clearly, more can be achieved with an army drawn from people known for their boldness. An army which a daring spirit, an army in which a daring spirit has always been nurtured than an army that lacks that quality. I mean, you can have a, co a company that employs only bold people. People prepared to take the sort of risks that are not necessarily required for survival. Uh, in advance, in an adventurous spirit, you know, etc., etc., and, and and I think you know if you look at your life, you you could apply that, as opposed to you know an environment that, that lacks that quality where everyone is timid and just sits there and 
and just takes everything as it comes. Um, for that reason, boldness in general has been mentioned here, even though our actual subject is the boldness of the commander. After having given a broad description of this military virtue, however, there is not much left to say. <laughs> the higher the military rank, the greater the degree to which activity is governed by the mind, uh, by the intellect, by insight. Consequently, boldness, uh, which is a quality of temperament, will tend to be held in check. Unless you're MacArthur, um, etc., etc. So what it's saying here that is that everything is more calculated and more deliberate, um, and, and that it's a, temp it's, it's a sort of a um, quality that really it, it comes from the ground up. But the higher up, you would less expect it to be applied because it's slightly risky, etc., etc. I mean, you could say Napoleon was bold. I mean, he certainly tried to be bold at Waterloo by driving ahead of himself to, to, to attack both armies separately and independently on their own and to defeat him piecemeal, you know, is always ahead of the game in that sense and, you know, you can say the boldness is the same thing. Um, and, and it's saying that basically, you know, it's quite hard for leaders at that level to, to maintain their boldness. Um, this explains why it is so rare in the higher ranks and why it is all the more admirable when found there. One of the things that sort of interests me is, I talk a lot about leaders here, whenever you hear anything about any sort of action, um, I mean, this Korean War book that I'm reading is, is is an exception, but you never really hear anything about the leaders themselves. I mean, not, since, 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 well, since Sherlock Holmes <laughs> retired, um, and um, there was a, a great pathologist whose name keeps cropping up in certain, certain channels. People are, as, you know, people are individuals that are no, noted for their excellence have been driven out by a sense of team spiritedness that essentially is, well, it's, 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 a, it's an odd one. I, I, I'm trying to get to the concept of de democracy because democracy is like a bunch of people and no one makes a decision and everyone makes it you know, all the decisions are essentially compromises between a lot of people on the pretense that it's the will of everyone, but it's not really. Um, but what I'm saying is, when you read these things, you don't sort of say, you don't hear, oh, this commander boldly led his troops into this particular province, or he did this, or, you know, just trying to see something that's not sort of partisan, and all that sort of dangerous stuff, really, sort of talking about these things, you know, Samara... Let's try and find something that's. Should maybe use smaller thumbnails. Oh, I don't know. That could be lost. As to what? Let's look at this one. Whatever it is. So this is sort of um, Iran Iraq War to the north against the, um, the Kurds, um, basically. Um, so, I mean, what, what I'm saying is, you, know, you could sort of, you know, where would you apply boldness on here at a strategic level? I mean, that's what I'm always, tr myself, tr trying to sort of figure out. Um, you know, by saying, well, okay, well, in this scenario, the obvious route would be to drive straight up here, straight down here, and, and to relieve this unit here. But could there have been other ways to do it? And, and would something else be bolder? Uh, could you sort of just completely ignore all this and just drive straight across this open track here and come up there? Um, you know, that probably wouldn't be a particularly great move. But you could sort of say, well, you, you, you know, in our struggle to find bold actions, could, could, could we do that? And, but my point was, you don't really hear of you know, the boldness of particular leaders and, and officers, and you don't even hear their names, and so everything is done by, you know, teamwork, and no one person is responsible for having a good thought, and how can you have boldness in an environment like that? Um, so, and it's, it's always these things, I don't want to be critical against anything, but whenever you're sort of thinking about this, you can't help but come to the conclusion that the people that have the most powerful armed forces these days are probably the least capable of presenting boldness and the sort of the qualities that we've been looking at because they're simply not in, involved 
in war at the sort of level that war has been described as for many many years i mean when i read this book on korea, the korean war again and again it talks about officers who haven't held command since the first world war um, or were retired at the end of the first world war or retired at the end of the second world war and were brought back in for the, for the korean war and were completely hopeless um and 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 it just draws on this juxtaposition of people that are just not experienced with war and if you were to take all these leaders that we have today, let's talk about the British leaders, for example, and you were to put them in an environment like the Korean War, I mean, let's just even look for the Korean War. Um, you know, this one here, for example, the Battle of Chipyongni, you know, how would they actually fare against all of this incoming, well, they didn't have the artillery, did they? So all this incoming firepower, you know, attack, wave attack after attack after attack you know as opposed to sort of probably sitting on an aircraft carrier 200 miles away 500 miles away you know commanding you know uavs or these are whatever you call them on un our unpiloted aerial vehicles hmm, i don't know what they're called these drones and things um ballistic strikes missile strikes um I mean, even if that you look at the Israeli one re recently, um, Israeli rocket strikes. I mean, it's all rocket and artillery, and then you've got these um, the the 401st Brigade, 52nd Regiment, uh, uh, 52nd Regiment Tank Brigade, Tank Regiment, whatever, sat there. And you sort of think, well, they're then people going to face imminent fire, uh, but you know, there's uh, and. and so well, there's a lot to be said for the fact that the Syrian army are battle hardened. Just sort of think, well, okay, well, fair enough, you can say that. But truly, to what extent does that actually mean? What effect does that have? Um, you know, I mean, would the troops be able to engage in anything other than, um, you know, r r remote indirect fire, smart missiles, and, and things like that? I mean, there was a very clear example of in the Korean War where they. S Basically, they needed extra regiments, and uh, I think McCarthy he got a couple, and they were they were, they were drawn up in in the states. And they were shipped straight over to Japan for their two weeks basic training, but they just didn't have time for that, so they shipped them straight to <laughs> Busan, and then straight to the front line, and straight into battle. And there were twelve or fifteen hundred men that went straight into battle, even with Greece still in their machine gun. I've said this in the video before. Over 60% of them died on the first day, and it's just unthinkable, really, that you could you could take that many untrained men these days at all. I mean, there's a lot of hurrah about these American seals that were shot in Nigeria, and there's four of them, you know. And it's sort of like, wow, well, it's it's a what is it? It's a, it's, it's a controversy how they could have been put into that situation. Imagine if these 600 men were just taken from the streets of America, from, you know, wherever, sent straight over to to um, to, to this place, dumped straight into the Kurdish territory and sent straight into the folds of the Syrian defences and all died, you know, it would be, the whole world would implode, you know, the media would go crazy about it. Um, you know, I've always said you can't wage, wage war the way we used to do it. You know, for those sorts of simple reasons, um, but the point is, what, what, what I want to sort of get into is, is this: you can't apply these things to these sorts of, you know, the concepts of boldness to to our modern warfare because they're just not on the ground. You know, and you you wonder if they were these situations were to happen, as I've just been explaining, what would actually happen? Um, you know, how many of these people would actually stand there, knowing? The, the chances of you dying are quite high. I mean, the Korean War, the accounts I'm reading, a regiment would go through uh, like 10 regimental commanders in a week. Um, and it's, someone made a joke to one regimental commander saying something along the lines of, you know, sending him up to his grave uh, because the last 10 commanders came back dead. Um, I mean, how would you behave and what would you do? Um, it's just unthinkable, really. But anyway, I'm going to carry on with this reading, so I've digest, 
digressed a little. While strategy, so while strategy is inclusive, exclusive to the province of generals and other senior um, bold senior officers, boldness, um, boldness in the rest of the army is an important fact. Is as an important factor uh, in planning as any other military virtue. Uh, more can be achieved with an army drawn from people known for their boldness and an ar um, as a boldness, an army in which daring spirit has always been nurtured and an army that lacks that quality. I think I've gone past that. Um, consequently, boldness, uh, which is a quality of temperament, will be held in check. Um, so what's he saying? The higher the uh, military rank, the, the greater the degree to which activity is governed by the mind, by the intellect, by insight. Consequently, boldness will be a quality of temperament. A com boldness, which is a quality of temperament, will be held in check. Uh, this explains why it is so rare uh, in the higher ranks and why it is all the more admirable when it's found this. That's what we've got to before. Boldness governed by superior intellect is the mark of a hero. This kind of boldness does not consist in defying the natural order of things and in crudely offending the laws of probability. It is rather a matter of energetically supporting that higher form of analysis by which genius arrives at a decision, a rapid, only partly conscious weighing of the possibilities. Um, I mean, that's an interesting thing, because I, I deal with that all the time in the things that I do. Um, when I do sort of things like programming, which I do a lot of, um, you end up with this concept of, let me just get that, so, um, I will say it's boldness, but it is rather a matter of energetically supporting that higher form of analysis of your thinking, by which, uh, and it says genius arrives at a decision, so you arrive at a decision, I won't say it's genius, but you arrive at, so supporting that higher level of ana analysis, which you make a decision rapidly, only uh, partly conscious, way, only partly consciously weighing of the possibility. So, I always put that down to what we call um, experience, you know, uh, and, and, and wisdom. Um, you can, when you, in theory, when you're younger, um, less experienced, you need to understand everything. But when you are experienced, you can make an understanding of a situation by only a small part, because then you assimilate and assume all the other part, component parts to that problem, or to that situation, from experience. Um, boldness can lead. But boldness can lend wings to intellect and insight. The stronger the wings, then the greater the heights, the wider the view, and the better the results, though a greater prize, of course, involves greater risks. The average man, not to speak of a hesitant or weak one, may, in an imaginary situation, in the peace of his room, far removed from the danger and responsibility, arrive at the right answer. That is, in so far as this is possible, without exposure to reality. That's interesting. Um, but beset on every side with danger and responsibility, he will lose perspective. Even if this is provided by others, he will lose his powers of decision. Um, for here, no one else can help him. Oh, I mean, that's just really interesting. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I would possibly agree with that. I want to speed things up a bit. But basically, it's, you know, the average man, not to speak of a hesitant or weak one, may, in an imaginary situation, in the peace of his room, such as I am, far removed from the danger and responsibility, as I am, arrive at the right answer, at which I do. Which I do. Uh, of course, um, that is, insofar as this is possible without exposure to reality, which I am completely not exposed to. Um, but beset on every side with danger and responsibility, he will lose perspective, as many members of Parliament do. Um, if the, even if this is provided by others, he will lose his powers of decision. Um, for here, no one else can help him. Um, in other words, a distinguished commander without boldness is unthinkable. No man who is not born bold can play such a role, and therefore consider this quality the first prerequisite of the great military leader. And again, we don't have any great military leaders. You know, that's what I was trying to point to with the, the analysis before. You know, I mean, if anyone was to say who, who leads the British Army at the moment, no one would know who's the second in command. You know, who, who's in command of this section or that section, or no one knows, and and and, and that's sort of been, I think, dissolved into ambiguity and, and to sort of this concept of, you know, someone else's job really. You know, team players, all team players. There's no boldness involved. It's all it comes sort of decreed in a PowerPoint presentation. 
So how much of this quality remains by the time he reaches senior rank after training and experience have affected and modified it is another question. Um, the greater the extent to which it is retained, the greater the range of his genius. The magnitude of the risks increases, but so does that of the goal. To the critical student, there is not much difference between actions governed by some compelling long-range aim and those that are dictated by pure ambition. Uh, between the politics of a Frederick, between the policies of a Frederick and an Alexander. I don't know what that means. The action of the latter may fascinate the imagination because of their supreme boldness. What are those of the former may be more satisfying to the intellect because um, they are dictated by an inner necessity. So you've got to understand the difference between Frederick and Alexander, which I don't. Um, we must mention one more factor of importance. Okay, we're listening. An army may be imbued with boldness for two reasons. It may come naturally to the people from which the troops are recruited, or it may be the result of a victorious war fought under bold leadership. If the latter is the case, boldness will be the will at the outset be lacking. Today, practically no means other than war will um, educate a people in this spirit of boldness, and it has to be a war waged under daring leadership. Nothing else will counteract with the softness and the desire for ease um, which debase the people in times of growing prosperity and increasing trade. A people and nation can hope for a strong position in the world only if national character and familiarity with war fortify each other by continual interaction. Well, well there you go. I mean, what more can we say? Um, I, I, I really like these things because you just don't hear anything told, spoken of in, in these ways now. I mean, I, it's, I just, I, I can't really think off the top of my head because I'm, you know, I'm doing this sort of on the fly, so to speak, of how boldness really comes into play in any sort of modern examples. Um, you know, everything seems to be a fairly static, you know, strategically static situation. Um, you know, I mean, there isn't really a, pl a place for sort of any bold moves that I can think of in the Ukraine. I mean, it's got this static line. Um, you know, I mean, if you look at the India, Pakistan, Kashmir situation, I mean, any bold moves would be, you know, all out war. Because there aren't actually any wars at the moment. I mean, you know, without again wanting to sound sort of like a terrorist, the actions of the you know, Al Qaeda and, and the, uh, and ISIS were fairly bold. Um, you know, there are attacks on Mosul in particular um, and Raqqa. You know, and taking these places out with almost a minimum of effort and bold actions. You know, it has to be said. And uh, and there was even the surprise themselves with the, with the outcomes. And it's almost I just feel like it's a war crime even even saying that. But you know, th those are were bold actions. And and the response by the Iraqi government and its allies. Well, not necessarily bold. I mean, they were delayed and slowed, and they did them when they had to. Um, but you know, where does do, where do examples of boldness fit into the modern world? You know, so we could say that that is one. And you know, you just keep coming back again and again to the only people being bold are the terrorists, sort of Boko Haram doing these surprise assaults. Um, you know, I mean, I've just heard recently that the Egyptian government have continued to their anti-insurgency operations across Sinai, you know, is that bold? Um, you know, and I don't think it's necessarily that easy or possible to define bold actions in those situations. But what would boldness be? I mean, where can we see, demonstrate that boldness is not in action and there could be in action? Um, you know, I mean, if, if it, MacArthur hadn't landed our inch on, we, we all said, oh, he's just not bold enough, you know, why hasn't he landed the inch on? Um, you know, you know. I, I mean, as I said, war Trump's actions bold in what he was doing. Cause he didn't necessarily have to do what he did. Um, you, you know, and his threats to, you know, against um, against Kim Jong Un, whatever his name is, on North Korea. You know, I felt he was going against the grain on a lot of that, and people were saying he's pushing for World War Three. And, and listen, to be quite honest, I stopped even t paying any attention to the modern media, you know, especially on things like that. You know, it's so reactionary.
but you could sort of say, well, you know, he's to some extent he was bold. I don't, I don't want to sound like a Trump supporter. I don't want to sound like a Taliban supporter. I just want to take it all you know, neutrally. But you could say that he was bold in really pushing the, the North Korean leader um, in a sense, in, in a way that perhaps people thought that maybe he shouldn't have uh, because it was dangerous. In the knowledge that that sort of pressure would force him to then accept something else that he was planning down the lines when he sent his, not in, even himself, he sent his agent or whatever over and then within an hour Kim Jong was saying he's going to stop nuclear processing and you could sort of think, well, you know, to what extent are his current actions against Iran saying, oh, I shouldn't do this against Iran and what ex to what extent are those bold actions that will pay off with Iran suddenly say, well, you know, Trump, we love you, and we're going to stop our nuclear power program right now, and we're all going to live happily ever after. You know, I mean, you know, could that be a You know, an example, a definition of modern boldness in leadership. I don't know. And again, we can talk about these things and and, and consider them. And after I stop recording, I'll probably think of other examples where boldness is clearly in play. Um, you know, um, I don't know, I mean, was the Falkland Islands a bold act on the part of the Argentinians? Was it a bold act to go down there and defend? Um, you know, was that a bold war? Was there a lot of bold, you know, were there lots of examples of boldness in play? Um, I mean, there are probably lots of bold people, but um, I don't know. But anyway, so that is the um, chapter on boldness from um, Karl von Klotzwitz's writings on strategy in general. I've simply learned that he's written a hell of a lot more, and what I'm reading out here is just a really small part of it. I've got tons of stuff to read, but I just think it's good to read this stuff and, and just sort of think about you know, what it means. The next chapter, which I'll probably do quite soon, and maybe not do it immediately, a few things I want to do, but it's a very short one, is on perseverance. And I just love these terms, but perseverance, hmm, okay, I can relate to that. Um, so that's the next one, so uh, stay tuned. I'll speak to you later, cheers, bye.